So we are here at KubeCon and Cloud Native Con, and today we have with us Neeraj. Neeraj, can you tell us a bit about yourself and the company that you created? Thank you. It's great to be here today. Uh, we are here in Copenhagen, and it's been wonderful uh, in terms of the conference. I, I'm Neeraj Tolia. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kasten. We are a startup based in California, in the Bay Area, and we are focused on how do we make it easy for everyone to build, deploy, and manage stateful cloud native applications that have started to emerge uh, across the board. You're talking stateful, and people are talking about serverless and all those things. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, but we'll get into there sure. later on mm -hmm. because there are so many things to talk yes. about. What's the story of the name Kasten? Kasten, uh, it's that's a great question. So Kasten is actually a German word. Mm -hmm. uh, so the roots are uh, from that language. It means box or container. So it's quite apropos given the uh, community we are part of and given the products we build. So it, there's a hidden message in there. Yeah. Why did you? A German, do you have a German connection? Also? Um, in yes, yeah, so you know, uh, through the family, actually, the uh, our logo designer, who's also uh, right, uh, has done work for us in the past. They are right now working. Um, she's in Germany right now. Oh, sorry, she's in Spain, but working on philosophy in German. Mm -hmm. So that's how some of the uh, branding happened there. Oh, okay. And when we ran into the name, we knew this was it. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to discuss any further. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. That's that, that's exciting. And now you are you know you're in uh, and is there's K in the name and mm -hmm. K in Kubernetes. Yes. And so you are here at KubeCon. Mm -hmm. has, how I mean today is the last day of the yes. conference. How mm -hmm. has been the conference so far for you? The conference has been great, right? So this is the third or fourth, fourth KubeCon we've been at. This is the second KubeCon we are sponsoring, mm -hmm. and overall we are. I'm honestly amazed at uh, the uh, about the conference for a number of things, just in terms of growth of the community, the people that have come here, and the depth of knowledge that they have. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this change for the community from people just learning about um, Kubernetes and trying to figure out how it can help them, to be running in production and having very deep technical questions as to some of the pain points they're running into, how they would get addressed. Um, so. From every angle that I can look at, I have been very, very happy uh, with KubeCon, and in particular in Europe. Right? It's traditionally been the scenario where European conferences run somewhat smaller than the corresponding US ones. And in this scenario, it's larger than the US one. And I'm very happy to see that also uh, come out. What is the reason? Um, I think it is a question. It is uh, the interest, uh, both from the developer as well from the operator side of things, and the fact that what we have seen is that the cloud native ecosystem is causing a very rapid shift in enterprises that traditionally people would classify as boring, whether it be manufacturing, pharma, things of that sort. People have seen that there's no always no silver bullet in the communities we live in. But there is this notion that this can really rapidly help people take things to market faster. Mm -hmm. And so this doesn't need to wait for someone else to adopt it first. People are jumping onto it. There's a lot of folks that try it out and say, look, this is the right thing for the organization. They push it up sometimes from the developer um, upward point of view. Sometimes it's the operators because it makes their life simple. They can focus on things that matter for the business. And so, we, and you'll see that adoption across the world, and that's why we're also looking forward to KubeCon China and seeing what hap happening on that side of the world too. This will be, I think, the first uh, KubeCon in Asia. The, mm -hmm. the, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you are here and you meet all these players, you know, some are mm -hmm. partners, some are competitors, some mm -hmm. are user. Uh, what are the pain points that you because Kubernetes is related to technology mm -hmm. and a lot of pro they're solving. Mm -hmm. that. What was the you know you're like oh this is the pain point that you know we are trying to solve or we should be solving. For okay, um, so I'll talk about it first from the community perspective, mm -hmm. then we'll talk about it also from um, our perspective. Mm -hmm. Right, generally what we have seen as also a mindset mindset shift in the people in the community mm -hmm. is they've gone from evaluating this technology, mm -hmm. uh, looking into whether this can help meet the needs to now using it. So it has switched over from day one to day two kind of operations. Um, we've also seen the growth of multiple groups within a larger organization running Kubernetes in particular. And that comes with now how does the central platforms team or central operations team help with these issues and managing things at scale, security comes up, running in multiple environments, multiple public clouds, private clouds, hybrid clouds, all of those things are becoming increasingly important to the people we speak to. 
And in particular, what we, Kasten as a company, is focused on is looking at operator pain points for data management. So a lot of, you know, you touched upon serverless in, um, a little while ago, but when we go look at customers, people have gone from doing somewhat simplistic stateless applications to more complex stateless applications to now more complex stateful applications. So we've seen this shift and all of those coexist obviously together. And even when you talk about things such as serverless, which Kubernetes is making a big push to also handle, the multiple platforms that can run on it, CNCF has a landscape that it publishes. And in that ecosystem too, it, we are not saying that state has gone away. State is still there, it's just been pushed off to manage data services that might be running either within the cluster or outside of the cluster. And all of those things, it go, they go together. What really makes up the application is not about does it run as events or functions in some service or running as containers. It's a collection of all these resources that make up the application. Mm -hmm. So then what does it mean to manage that, right? So if you're running a retail site or if you're a financial firm, I mean, how do you make sure a ransomware attack suddenly doesn't bring your business down? So what does backup and recovery mean for that? Or how do you deploy the same stack across multiple cloud environments, mm -hmm. um, your database stack on different storage infrastructure? How do you take care of the migration use cases, whether it be for test dev? We often run into customers that code that works amazingly in staging environments falls over in production because the data sets might be synthetic or might not have been recently updated in the staging environment. So how do you automate that on a regular basis? How do you move to another cloud region or cloud provider for disaster recovery? So all of these data management actions are things that we focus on today as a company. Okay, and uh, now from challenge, mm -hmm. let's uh, switch to new use cases or exciting use cases. Or, mm -hmm. What have you seen here then? Um, so in terms of new and exciting use cases, I think, the way that people are approaching the problem has dramatically shifted. Mm -hmm. right? uh, traditionally, when you go look at vendors, or you go look at infrastructure players, people generally think of it from the bottom up. Right? That they look at it from the perspective of, here's my disks, here's my networking, here's my load balancer, things of that sort. What has been amazing is how the mindsets have shifted to be application first and developer first. That people start thinking about it from a top-down point of view, which is very aligned with how these platforms have been built. So it's about the application as the organizational unit. It's about the application as the unit that one manages, one operates, one deploys. Mm -hmm. And then you worry about infrastructure. Yes, the application has a load balancer component, the application has a security component, it has state that runs on disk, um, or maybe in an object storage system. But it's a collection of that and how you think about it first that I find exciting because it's the right way to do it. And what is different here compared to doing this in the traditional VM world is a well-defined APIs. You don't need to infer anything, you can introspect, you can figure this out at runtime, and that allows for the creation of a lot more powerful tools that can operate on this. We're seeing the controller and the operator patterns emerge, there have been a number of keynotes around this. So, um, but that is just, I believe, the start of the journey where we see Kubernetes now being treated as the platform you program against. And it's still early on in there, and we'll see a lot more work happen that makes it more approachable and usable for developers. Uh, but I think this is a start of a journey that's gonna be very exciting over the next couple of years. Right, right. Uh, another thing is, uh, which is interesting is that everybody's talking about Kubernetes, Kubernetes, mm -hmm. and a few years ago, we used to hear the same thing about OpenStack yes. and Docker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was having the same conversation earlier also, and. Uh, is it because the whenever a new technology comes in, you know, uh, industries and companies they get excited how they can use it, you know. Mm -hmm. and so the hype cycle is created, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the technology itself evolves at a natural pace, mm -hmm. but there is a, a artificial hype that gets mm -hmm. generated. What do you think is going on with Kubernetes? Okay, so you know uh, we were involved with some of the OpenStack components in a previous life too um, at a different company. So I've seen that OpenStack ecosystem grow. I'm seeing the Kubernetes ecosystem grow. There's some parallels in terms of rate of growth, but there are very large differences in terms of how the not just how the community is structured and organized but how development is happening in this space. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very good sign for the health of the ecosystem that right. we live in. So there is obviously this A aspect of high people want to figure out right, how things will be valuable, things of that nature. But from the perspective of when I looked at and I compared to the OpenStack community, 
And OpenStack has done a lot of good things. We cannot, you know, just dismiss OpenStack. No, I don't yep. dismiss it. I yep. said, you know, it's yep. natural. They're yes. is natural, but we, yep. I mean, I don't say we, but, you know, industry created a hype around it. You know? Yes. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the hype around industry, when you look at OpenStack, had tended to be vendor-led. Right. If you know that, mm -hmm. if you remember. Um, with a lot of vendors trying to say, how do I commercialize this? How do I make sure that, you know, how do I sell OpenStack as a product in some way, shape or form? Um, in this case, we still see vendors in the ecosystem, and that's a healthy sign. But it's not based on, you know, really how to create yet another Kubernetes distribution, things of that nature. But it's more based around the pull from people using this in production, right? And how do I service those pain points? And that's a far healthier sign mm -hmm. than saying, this is the how I believe it should be, versus saying, here is how people are using it. Here is what we need to do to get it to the next stage. Right. And the multiple efforts there. Uh, vendors are working much better together mm -hmm. um, as far as also pushing things forward. And I think a lot of the leaders in all the SIGs or the special interest groups in within Kubernetes, whether you look at six storage, six gaps, really put the vendor relationship out of the view and concentrate on what it means for the user, for the developer, for the application. And that's the right approach. Um, and that I think uh, will make sure that you know, at some point in time the hype dies off, but it makes sure that the ecosystem is very healthy at that point in time. And I, I feel I may be wrong that uh, Linux Foundation has a long experience either way. You know, they have so many projects, so it also mm -hmm. helps you know having that experience. And uh, because there's a lot of cr cross pollination happens, so people have had you know their chance to learn and make mistakes and then fix them. Yes, yeah. um, and I think Linux Foundation does a great job. Linux Foundation as the parent project, CNCF underneath that because there's not only just strong leadership um, out there, there's, as you mentioned, the strong leadership that has seen this happen in multiple different contexts and that can influence things in the right way. Right. I really like the fact that they are not here to say this is a winner or right, this is the one that we bless, but they're pushing the open source ecosystem, which is a great thing in this space, um, then, but they're making sure that the community evolves in the right way. And sometimes it's a thankless job. So really I would like to thank everyone in right. CNCF that does this because you know everyone doesn't, when they don't get the way what they want, it leads to issues for them, but they've they've taken the right decisions in that space. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. and that's working for them. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. One more thing that I like about CNCF or uh, Linux Foundation in general is that they're focused on diversity. Mm -hmm. They want their co-handle, you know, he's, you know, from VMware mm -hmm. he was like, you know, uh, we should hire more women, we should, you know, mm -hmm. but it's not just diversity, not just for, you know, gender, you know, there are a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about, you know, uh, uh, diversity in this uh, Kubernetes space? Okay, so uh, there are two or three things. Um, what I love about the community is not just about things like code of conduct, but the fact that we are very welcoming and open. Um, we already see a lot of representation from underrepresented uh, minorities in the space, you know, they're showing up at conferences, giving talks, serving on the program committees. So all of those things in my mind are positive thing. That said, I still think we need to do a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, when you go look at the show floor today, we are still, as a community, predominantly male. We need to make it more open, more accessible mm -hmm. uh, for people from different backgrounds and non-traditional backgrounds that might not have done. Um, computer science uh, from an early career point of view. So how do you do that is going to be important as this community grows. Mm -hmm. um, and right, people of color, other, um, and uh, we have, uh, me personally, this is something I care a lot about, right, in terms of teams I've built in the past as well as teams we're building at Kasten. We try to make sure that it's about, um, diversity is a big thing, but it's not just about diversity. And this is another thing where CNCF is doing the right thing. It's also about inclusion, mm -hmm. right? So diversity, at least in my mind, is somewhat simplistic, but it's about making sure there's representation across the board. But inclusion is making sure that it's not just we have people from these other backgrounds, but making sure we have the right environment for them to succeed in. Um, that they have a seat at the table, that they are the people that get promoted, that they're the people get, that get the opportunities and helping them service some of that is I think where also more focus needs to be. That is how do we also build not just a diverse community but also an inclusive community mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes from every, that goes from every layer in the stack in some sense from companies that get set up, communities that form around special interests or all the way to broader organizations like CNCF today. Right, and mm -hmm. uh, 
And uh, I also see that them as a vector of change and influence because mm -hmm. you know it's a CNCF organization, but they have member companies. Mm -hmm. So when the influence, then it trickles down to those companies and influence you know those mm -hmm. companies as well. Yes. I mean you're right. You know these days, you know while there are a lot of efforts going on, the situation is still needs to you know. So mm -hmm. I think there should be a blind hiring that you know you should the HR manager should not be able to see your name and sex mm -hmm. and you know everything. Uh, gen sorry, gender mm -hmm. or you know race or whatever it is. Yep. Mm -hmm. It should be based on your GitHub repo or whatever yeah. it is. Um, so I think. Um, so, so anyway, sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt you. No. But how at Cast and how do you ensure? Uh, okay, it's a great question, right? So a lot of things I think are sometimes for the way we run it and how we encourage this. First of all, is from day one having a diverse uh, team, right? Especially at once your company grows to a certain stage, it's very hard to change culture. It's not impossible, but harder. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think starting off with the right things in mind, starting off with the right core team definitely helps. Um, and we did that. The other thing is in terms of a hiring process, the way we run things is a little different, right? There is some amount of uh, anonymization you can do for resumes, but it's more about how we set up the interview structure, where how do we surface the strengths of candidates. How do we set up the interview structure for people to succeed versus it be a way to filter people out or to get them in, you know, in bluntly to fail. Mm -hmm. So setting people up for success is more valuable in my mind because it helps surface candidates that might not have the, you know, I started programming in, you know, when I was a freshman in high school kind of scenario where people that might have come from a different background into computer science or into the space. And then how do you expose their strengths as to what value they bring to the team, right? And then there's a culture mindset as well when you bring people in, letting people know what we value in an organization. That is, we do not want group things. We value diversity of thought. It's not just diversity of you know people of color or gender or orientation. But this is about diversity of thought there too and what we value. And that also has an impact on the hiring. Obviously, right, um, there are uh, other things that we can do to improve just the hiring uh, pool that one selects from. Because if you go to traditional venues to go look at hire, that can be an issue. But something we've started looking at more recently is what are non-traditional places to go look at um, to also be able to attract candidates. And I think that will be another right, uh, tool in our toolbox to help build a more diverse team out there. Because what happens is uh, different cultures, they have different ways of solving the problem. Mm -hmm. So when you put everybody in the in the mix, mm -hmm. you can solve the problem in so many different ways. I was talking to Brian Bellendorf and he was like, you know, if your open source community does not look like our global community, mm -hmm. it won't start sustain for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of true, especially in the open source world, yes. where you are getting, mm -hmm. you know, diverse, you know, mm -hmm. from different, you know. Yeah. And that goes to write also how you set up, when you talk about open source, it's about how you set up communities that mm -hmm. people that might have never seen each other. Right. How do you ensure that people are kind, respectful, because code is a component of what we do here mm -hmm. today. But the health of the ecosystem is based around people. people. That's um, it. And it is based around how welcoming we are to new contributors. Uh, it is based around how we, how quickly we can make them feel like they're part of uh, right. the community. And all of those things, I think, starting off from scratch, we've talked about what CNCF does, but I think there's more awareness in the space, which really does help because, as you mentioned, people with different cultural backgrounds, how do you make sure that they're comfortable for really what is truly global organizations today? And, and the thing is, no matter what you're using, whether you're using Kubernetes or in the end, it's going to help, you know, some person, you know, some individual is going mm -hmm. to help people. You know, all these technologies are not for the sake of technology. So people exactly. are always the center. doesn't matter whether mm -hmm. end user yes. or the, <laughs> yeah. the, at, yeah, the, yeah. At, the, at the product level. Yeah. Uh, let's just switch topics mm -hmm. from yeah. culture mm -hmm. and everything. Um, what, was the, what, is the, what are the new trends that you're seeing in this space? Because you have been in this space for a while and, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so the new trends that I see in the space are rather, you know, things that people have talked about that are becoming more reality today is people really running in some sort of planet scale environment. I mean, it has traditionally been harder to do, but now we have customers that run across multiple data centers all over the world. And it's not just about multiple public clouds or hybrid where you have on-prem stuff with public clouds, but it's really about how do I treat all of this together mm -hmm. um, in some sense? And what does that mean for my applications, for my development process, for my end customers, especially if they're external to the company? 
So we see a lot of um, talk about planet scale stuff, whether it be planet scale databases, multiple clusters in use, and uh, we see definitely that is emerging. Um, there's a lot of interest in serverless. It's still very old yes. days, um, but there's a lot of talk around that. Um, anything that'll have a dramatic impact on how applications are built over the next few years. It's still early. We see people running a lot of pain there. Um, just once you have finished your first application, once you want to scale up, not from the purposes of how many IOPS you can handle, but the number of applications, what it means to be an application. Um, there is at least some pain there, but I think as a function, it allows you to, or rather allows developers to focus on what they care about most mm -hmm. while delegating other things to the underlying infrastructure. And I think that's going to be um, quite powerful in terms of technology trends. Um, right, we've touched upon community a lot, so I won't cover that, but just really how people from different places are coming together to mm -hmm. build these technologies is a very big deal. Um, and I'm more power to everyone working in this field um, uh, to do that. I think those are the things that really jump out top of mind today when we look at all of this stuff. You, you mentioned serverless, uh, and mm -hmm. we talked about that earlier also. Uh, when you talk about function as a service, it's mm -hmm. mostly today when we see it's tied to the public cloud. You know, there are three yes. providers, mm -hmm. uh, which also creates a risk of vendor lock-in. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. when we talk about open source, the whole idea is, you know, to mm -hmm. break the vendor lock-in. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts about that? So I think that's a very genuine concern. And it's not just about vendor lock-in. It's also about, right, it's, uh, when you go look at the success of some of the related technologies in the cloud native world, it's because a developer can do the same thing on the laptop that they can do in production, mm -hmm. right? That's why Docker was successful and really there's a big push around that. I think the same thing applies here. And I really like what I'm seeing in the community with some of these um, serverless or function as a service platforms being based on Kubernetes as an example. And I think that would be one of the ways forward around this where obviously all cloud vendors would like stickiness on their platforms. Um, but developers, larger companies would prefer the independence of portability. Mm -hmm. And I think this gives you that meeting, you know, the happy middle ground there Pretty much every public cloud provider um, has offers managed Kubernetes as a service. And some of the serverless platforms that run on that give you this uh, portable way of being able to move things across things. So obviously, this is all great in theory. Ultimately, what really makes function as a service or some of the serverless stuff useful is not just that, but all the community dependencies that it has, whether it be object storage, a you NoSQL know, system, a structured database, um, a message queue, and all of that ecosystem needs to come along with it, apart from just that one framework. But I think, given the fact Kubernetes is already multi-cloud um, and global today, building serverless platforms on top of this will give you the portable portability aspect of things, which people are looking for right now. Yeah. Uh, do, do you think we? I mean, we can talk a lot about yeah. a lot of things, but I mm -hmm. think we touched upon some broad topics. You mm -hmm. know, uh, so, is there anything else you would like to touch upon? No, I think this is this has been a really good conversation. Right? I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. You Thank know, you. It was nice meeting you, and it's we will be here. seeing you again in the next Cube Corner. Definitely, and in the Open Source yes, conference. definitely. Uh, really looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah.